Thank you very much, Dr. Ross. And uh, I will go home with many gifts and many remembrances of my time here. As I was uh, talking to my host this evening, I did mention to him that by the time I do go home tomorrow, it will be high time that I return to people who know me well, because I have heard a number of introductions here which have been rather psychologically unhealthy for me. <laughs> I have uh, enjoyed them enormously, far too much. But uh, it will be good to be back with my wife, who uh, has her way of bringing me back to reality in a number of subjects, <laughs> and uh, especially any subject that has to do with me personally. I'm sure that it'll be great to be with her. But it, is, it has been just delightful to be here, and uh, not only to experience the warmth and fellowship that I have enjoyed in several of your homes and in conversations with you, but uh, simply to sense the uh, earnestness and the feeling of urgency that you people possess with respect to the communication of the gospel. It is uh, so heartwarming and encouraging to remember that in this part of the North American continent, too, there are those who are dedicating their lives to expressing with ever greater efficiency and power the message of salvation through Christ. And uh, I'll return to my work with a feeling of being in harness with people like yourself, working together with you in carrying out our combined ministry. I might just also take a moment to uh, say a word about the ministries of the Back to God Hour, if I may, just a moment, uh, because we are engaged in ministries in a variety of languages, and I'm going to just mention those languages and catalog them for you because it may be that our organization could be of service to some of you in the ministries that you are engaged in or possibly may be engaged in in the next several years or you may know of someone who is working in one of these languages and let me just mention them the English language of course we're also involved in a French language ministry which has as one of its main target areas the French speaking parts of Canada and we're also very pleased that in the area of the city of Montreal, we are able to have a French-speaking television program. Reverend Aaron K. Ayon, who came to our office from Paris just a few months, uh, a few years ago, conducts this French-speaking ministry. In addition, we have ministries in Spanish and Portuguese and Japanese and Chinese, Indonesian and Arabic and Russian. And I simply wanted to mention them in case some of the literature, perhaps, or some of the tapes that have been produced in these languages may be of some value to you. Now, as we think about our subject this evening, I would like to just begin by reading a few words from the book of Jeremiah, the second chapter, beginning at verse 4 and reading through verse 8 of Jeremiah 2, where we find this word of God, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, all you clans of the house of Israel. This is what the Lord says, What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and rifts, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, Where is the Lord? 
Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. Last evening, when we were talking together about the ethics of preaching, I tried to describe four contexts which provide the frame of reference in which we conduct our activities as we preach the Word of God. And I would like to take up that subject now further, mentioning each one of them this evening and speaking about biblical material that will enable us to resist the forces and the influences that impinge upon us from each of these contexts. When I think about these contexts and ourselves and the responsibilities which are ours as we preach the Word of God, I guess that I am thinking about them in a way that roughly parallels the way physicists describe the various forces that hold the universe together. You have heard the names of these forces, just as I have, and I certainly would not be able to speak in any depth about any of them, except it, I find it intriguing to think of the fact that these forces are the cement, so to speak, that holds the material universe in the form that we have become accustomed to encounter it. Physicists speak about gravity, with which we are all familiar, and about electromagnetic force, which I am told holds together the component elements of atomic nuclei, electromagnetic force. And then they speak of a strong force and a weak force, which they are able to describe in terms of the relative strength of these forces vis-a-vis -vis gravity and electric magnetic force. In any case, these forces are continuously in operation and they can be used to explain the very minutest elements of matter that are parts of our bodies and of this table behind which I stand and they can be used to describe and explain the various relationships of planets and stars within the universe. Now in somewhat the same way as we live and conduct our ministries and express the preaching responsibility that God has laid upon us, there are a variety of forces that impinge upon us. And it is these forces, it seems to me, which tend to qualify the purity or the lack of purity of our motivations as preachers. I expect that as we have been talking about this over the last couple of days, those of you who have been present have recognized that when we talk about ethics and preaching, what we're talking about specifically is the quality of motivation which preachers possess as they carry out their activity. And I think that it is an obvious maxim that when the motivation that is present in a preacher's life is seriously corrupted by motivations that are improper, that the minister, as he proclaims the word of God, actually becomes involved in an activity which is morally less than ideal. Motivation is the key. You will recall that I believe it was last evening I referred to the fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul in speaking about himself says that his own conscience was clear, the third 
verse, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. And that, at that time, each will receive his praise from God. So when we talk about the ethics that are related to the activity of preaching, what we're really asking is, what about that individual who is involved in preaching to us? Why is he doing what he is doing? Why is he doing it the way he is doing it? Why is he, what are his motivations for including this material and excluding that material? What is going on inside of him that makes him, for example, refer frequently to himself and his own family and various types of circumstances? And what is happening inside of him as he conducts his work? Now, there may be some who suggest that that kind of self-consciousness on the part of preachers is really quite neurotic and inappropriate. But I think, as we shall see further as we get into this this evening, that the Bible makes clear that it's not inappropriate, that preachers have to be concerned about those things that motivate them as they carry out their work. And the Church of Jesus Christ has a responsibility to express itself in terms of its discipline over against its ministers, ministers so that it can make sure that their motivation is what it should be. Now, last evening, when we talked about these contexts, the reason we did so is that it seems to me that if we think about this, we can see that there are forces that are generated in these various contexts that impinge upon us that tend to qualify our motivations. Just to give you an example, remember we began by talking about the anthropological, sociological context and that massive movement that can be detected and described in culture which tends to bring together the religious and the governing elements of culture. If you were here, you may recall that we talked about the tendency within primitive cultures to unite in one individual, both the governing and the holy aspects of that culture. Now, we have the same thing happening in our countries today, in yours and in mine. And there are serious temptations that come into our lives as ministers in terms of this force that is present in our cultural situation. I'll just mention one that I have. Several years ago, it began, this particular temptation. I began to receive very large envelopes in our office, addressed to me personally, from the White House. And I remember very clearly when the first one arrived, because I was quite excited about it, and I opened it to discover that there was an invitation in it to me personally to come to the White House and participate or be present at a special presidential briefing, which Ronald Reagan was going to uh, hold. That was related, I believe, to Central America at that particular time. And I, I uh, was very impressed that they would consider it worthwhile to invite me to this. And I was beginning to make arrangements to change my schedule to make sure that I would be there when somewhere deep inside of me I began to think a little bit more deeply about this. And I thought to myself, now just a minute. I don't know if you want to become a spokesman for the administration in connection with the particular policy that's going to be dealt with at that briefing. And I don't recall all that went into the decision, but I'm very grateful today that I did not go then and I have not gone since. 
regularly invitations of this nature will will come into the office and uh, oftentimes packets of information designed to brief people like myself who happen to be in the media on the presidential the president's position I must say that uh, in some degree I often benefit from these but I recognize in them also an expression of this tendency within culture that we were talking about last evening where the political side of society and social life cannot really rest until it has enlisted the allegiance of the religious side of a culture. And so there has to be these continuous invitations and overtures made to the religious dimension of the culture to come and provide what's necessary and what is desired for this political life. So there are these contexts that come into our lives that we have to be aware of because only if we are aware of them can we resist them. And now this evening, what I would like to do is talk about these four contexts once again and talk about the kinds of biblical data which it seems to me will equip us to resist the temptations that come into our lives simply to succumb to the impulses that arise out of these various contexts. Now, in connection with this first one, it seems to me that the biblical material that we have regarding the serious threat to social and personal life which is posed by idolatry, that data is particularly important. I say that because I believe that in terms of this broader context, this anthropological, sociological context, what is really happening is that society is attempting to move away from the rule of Jesus the Lord and is attempting to substitute for that rule some other kind of construct which functions in the same way that idols functioned in the Old Testament and also in the New. We were talking, I believe it was yesterday in our meeting, about the way in Soviet society the person of Lenin has become a religious focus for that society. And when you travel through the Soviet Union, you see statues of him everywhere, you see pictures of him everywhere, and in that particularly, particular event, you can observe a kind of obvious expression of the tendency to idolatry. Now, the, it's not an accident, obviously it's not an accident, that the law of God opens with an address to the tendency in human society to create other gods in the place of God. In fact, when you read the Bible and you train yourself to read the Bible in terms of the problem of idolatry, you begin to discover that from a certain perspective the Bible can be described in its totality as a powerful polemic directed against idolatry. Now, the Bible is, of course, a book of salvation. And that's a major theme in the Bible. But if you want to find a category that you can use to capture the nature of its structure and its point, the category of idolatry will really work quite well. I'm indebted in this connection to a, a book that's been very influential in my life, by Arendt van Leeuwen, a book which some of you may know. He's a phenomenologist of religion, and he wrote a book called Christianity 
and world history. And he has a chapter in it called The Hebrew Religion in connection, uh, in contrast with the world religion, and I, with, 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 the, with the culture in which it was found. And I'm, I'm not giving you the exact title of that chapter because it's escaped me at the moment. But the book is called Christianity and World History. And the chapter to which I'm referring is most fascinating because he delineates with such clarity the fact that the Bible is a straightforward attack against this social force that seeks to create in the place of God a unity between the ruling forces and the holy forces. The opening chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, when you read them in the light of this polemic, they achieve a certain special force. I believe that the opening chapters, the opening verses of Genesis are historical. That they represent historic events in the usual sense of the word historical. But it's fascinating to remember that the Holy Spirit used a person to write these chapters who was enormously well-schooled in the idolatrous religion that was found throughout the entire Fertile Crescent and affected Egypt. Moses, who learned about Jehovah from his mother, also learned about this false religion in Pharaoh's court. He knew it perfectly. And I believe that the Holy Spirit so arranged the structure of those first chapters of the Bible that those who followed idolatry in those days when they read them recognized at once that they were being confronted by a piece of literature which literally mocked that false worldview upon which they had built their lives. Throughout the Bible, there is consistently a mockery of the idle worldview. The book of Isaiah speaks about the foolishness of idols. The 46th chapter mocks Babylon for having to carry its gods from place to place. Bel bows down. Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. These are the gods of these people. The God of Israel is a God who daily bears the burdens of his children. Psalm 68 speaks of that. Cast your cares upon the Lord. He will sustain you. But the idols must be carried from place to place. And so again and again, the mockery of the idols recurs in the scripture. Psalm 115 speaks about this very, very clearly. Why do the nations say to Israel, Where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. But their idols are silver and gold, made by the hands of man. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. Eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. 
feet, but they cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. And again and again throughout the Old Testament, and I'm not going to belabor this point because it is, it is substantiated continuously in the Scripture, but again and again the Bible makes so very clear that an idol God will turn those who follow it into a foolish people. And that's why I read Jeremiah, too, spoke about the people of Israel, who, as he said, worshipped foolish idols and became foolish themselves. The New Testament rebellion against God is also cast in terms of idolatry. First John concludes with the words, Brothers, keep yourself from idols. The Thessalonians are congratulated because they turned away from their idols to serve the living God. Idolatry is the category that we can use as the general umbrella category that all other sins can be placed beneath. Listen to this from Ephesians 5. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So what I'm trying to emphasize is this. Within our culture there are all kinds of forces that would like to enlist our service in support of secular idolatrous forces that form the culture in which we live. God summons us to wrap around ourselves the cloak of the Bible and to, to arm ourselves with the arsenal of the scripture and to resist with everything that we have the idolatry of our age. The second context that we talked about last evening is the cultural context, the world in which we now live. If you will recall what we said last evening, we talked about such things as these. We talked about the fact that the culture in which we live today is a materialistic culture. It is a culture that is amoral. It is eclectic and relativistic. It is a, it is a culture in bondage to the visual. And there are other things that can be said about it. This, too, provides a context in which we live. And when we preach, we are tempted simply to make our message subservient to the support of this culture. We talked last evening about the church sect typology that Ernst Trubsch has developed when he talked about the fact that a church is precisely that religious institution within a society that provides a society with the religious justification for the things that it does. And a sect is a religious institution within society, according to his definition, which enters into conflict with the society in which it's found. Now, in terms of these functions, I think we should pray that we will be sectarian, that we will not simply capitulate to the materialism, the relativism, and some of the other characteristics that are a part of the time in which we live. Again, there are all sorts of data in the scripture that can equip us to resist these forces that impinge upon us. 
The very scripture itself is a scripture that enables us to resist the emphasis, for example, in our time upon the visual. Now the bondage to the visual which human beings currently demonstrate should not be viewed as a step forward, as progress. The Bible makes very clear that when it comes to the eyes of human beings, they leave a great deal to be desired. The book of Proverbs speaks about the fact that it is impossible to satisfy our eyes John, in his first general epistle, says, For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The fact of the matter is that the Christian religion is a religion that has been contained in and communicated by a written revelation. And in this world, dominated by visual images as it is, it is important for us to recommit ourselves as preachers of the gospel to the authority of the sacred scriptures. Not in some kind of scholastic sense, but on the deepest level, recognizing that we, by virtue of our relationship to God, sustain a relationship to a word revelation that has to be continuously emphasized if the vitality of the Christian faith is going to be maintained. The Old Testament, of course, as you know, was not unwilling to equate the Word of God with something as difficult to define as life itself. Listen to this from Deuteronomy 32. Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. The grace of God to the people of the Old Testament was demonstrated in the fact that he provided them with a word revelation. The fourth chapter of the book, book of Deuteronomy says this, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws that I'm setting before you today. Teach them to your children and to their children after you. The Christian faith is anchored in the bedrock of a word revelation. And however visual a culture may become, those who are responsible to give it spiritual leadership are going to be responsible to derive their message from this word, and they are responsible to work with their people in such a way that those who have been entrusted to their care will understand the word of God. And we've talked about some of these things in our talkback sessions, and there's no question about it. We have to use the visual medium, the media today, and as it exists in various forms. There's no question about that. We're not talking about that now. But when we use the visual media, we must be sure that we use it to enhance and strengthen the power 
of the word. So we resist this aspect of our culture in the degree that we live with increasing obedience to the word of God. One other note at this point, and that is this. The Bible provides us with the ability, the motivation and the ability to resist the materialism of this age. It must be resisted. And it must be resisted by preachers. Woe to the preacher who succumbs to the materialism of this age. Now, we have been conditioned to think that in some way there's something great about being wealthy, even as a minister, and living a lavish lifestyle. And there are many Christians today in North America who believe that's true. But when I look at 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, where the Apostle Paul is talking about the nature of his ministry, it's fascinating that he talks about this very issue. Listen to this. But thanks be to God, who continues to lead us about in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are of God, are to God, the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life, and who is equal to such a task? Paul here in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, is, is with almost trembling hands uncovering the awesome nature of the proclamation of the word, and he says, when we proclaim the word, it's going to make some people more liable to judgment and hell, and others it will bring into the presence of God. And he says, who is equal to such a task? And then he gives an answer. He doesn't say nobody is equal to such a task. But he says this, who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. It's very instructive that at this point where the Apostle Paul is speaking about the nature of gospel proclamation in one of its, his most awesome passages, he lays hold on that particular aspect of his ministry and he says listen let it be understood perfectly clearly that we are not doing this for personal profit and consequently we are very sincere and what we're seeing happening today just to think that there are millions of Christians today in North America who have been misled into thinking that it's perfectly all right for a minister of the gospel. Now, I'm not speaking against wealth in general. I'm not doing that. But it's perfectly all right if a minister is smart enough and capable enough and he can run his own organization in a certain way. It's perfectly all right for him to earn a great deal of money and live in a lavish way. Many people believe that. The Bible is so thoroughly opposed that. I just turned to the book of Jude. And whenever you read this, it's so stirring. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. The prophet who wanted to prophesy for profit for Balak. You remember him. And they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. And he says of him, these men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves, they are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead, they are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. And right here is one of the big problems, of course, as you know, that we have today in connection with religious broadcasting, particularly television broadcasting. Just a few weeks ago, just a few days ago, 
We had a meeting in Washington, D.C. of the National Religious Broadcasters. The National Religious Broadcasters in the United States today are very concerned because of all of the disgraceful things that have happened that they introduce into broadcasting new levels of accountability. And they want to put together a code that everyone is supposed to sign. And the essence of that code is this, that you, you take the money that you get and you make sure that you use it for the purposes that you have solicited it for. But no one is raising this fundamental issue, and that is this. May you use a proclamation of the gospel as a fundraising instrument in any way. No one is asking that question. And why is that? The reason they're not asking the question is that the Christian community has been so largely brainwashed by this one context we were talking about a few months, the cultural context, the, col the context which is materialistic, which, puts, which measures success in terms of money and puts a price tag on everything and says, well, look, if you've got a group of people together, you might as well sell them something. There's no use having a group together and letting that go to waste. But no one is questioning that basic premise that they may use their broadcast to raise money. And that's how a large segment of the religious establishment has succumbed, you see, to this context. But as we live out of the scriptures again, we will be able to resist. I mentioned the ecclesiastical context as well. The things that happen within our churches, church political realities, and when I use the concept church political, I do not do so in a pejorative way. I recognize that in the nature of the case, all human groupings have a political dimension. And obviously, every ecclesiastical grouping is going to have some kind of, of a political dimension to it. We talk together, and I've talked with some of you personally, about the fact that oftentimes we can have situations in our local churches, situations of conflict that oftentimes can trouble us and can enter into our sermon preparation and the way we conduct ourselves on the pulpit. But it seems to me, and I don't have the time to go into this in any, detail, in any detail, but I think that all of you can apply this yourself. It seems to me that what we have when we look at the 20th chapter of the book of Acts and the Apostle Paul describes his relationship to the Ephesian Christians, in this we find data that we can use which, which wrenches our attitudes back where they belong when we get ready to go into the pulpit and preach to our churches. This is what he says. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Guard yourselves in all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. When we think about our ministries and when we stand on our pulpits on Sunday mornings and we look at those people before us, then in those moments we must pray for the grace to divest ourselves of all sorts of ideas and animosities and attitudes that flow perhaps from certain conflict situations that we may have with some of them, to divest ourselves of anything within our persons that may in any way relate to our desire, let's say, to move forward in church circles. And in those moments, we must feel intensely that we are being confronted by the people whom Jesus has purchased with his own blood. And we must speak to them, recognizing that more than anything else in all the world, they need 
the gospel of God's great grace because any one of them tomorrow could be dead. I think in my own work on television, which is a daily program, I, I can never forget it. Some people say it must be a strange thing to talk to a television camera, just to talk to a television camera. That's what I have to do, and it is strange, until you remember that on the other side of that camera there is a man, a woman, a child who will never, ever have an opportunity to hear the gospel again, ever. How awesome it is. And this is what we remember. This is what the Apostle Paul remembered. And this is why when the Apostle Paul preached, what did he preach about? He preached about Jesus. And he preached about the cross of Christ. Because he realized that while it's true, he might have had his differences with this person or with another person or with some apostle even who may have opposed him, when he came to that point of intersection where he, as God's spokesman, stood before these people who were on their way to an eternity, and he was on his way to an eternity with them, there was only one thing to speak about. And so every time anew, his approach was focused upon the essential of the scripture, the essentials of the faith. I have come to feel, and some of you know the Christian Reformed Church very well, probably some of you here tonight are from the Christian Reformed Church, and I'm very, very thankful for my church. It represents a branch of the Christian faith which has a very interesting doctrinal treasury, and it's been a privilege to have been nurtured from out of this church. It's been a privilege indeed, and it's been a privilege to, to be able to make some distinctions, theological distinctions, and look at things from various perspectives, and that's all wonderful. That's all wonderful. But when we, we're talking about the ethics of preaching now, you understand. We're, that's our subject. We're talking about preaching. We're talking about the responsibilities that an individual has when that person is preaching the gospel. And at that point, there is basically one central task that must be expressed, and that is that Jesus Christ must be held aloft and people must be called to faith in the Savior. I think the view of the Baptist tradition, oftentimes when we think about your style of services, we recall, those of us who are Reformed, we recall that your services frequently contain an invitation, a call, a, a, an altar call, perhaps you would call it. And I think that you do that very well. I've had altar calls only, only a few times in my ministry, and I do it very poorly, so I avoid it. I don't have altar calls. But I always admire those who do it well. But one thing that I am certain of, and that is this, that in every sermon, every person who is in the congregation has to be confronted with the obligation and the necessity to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Now, it's not the first decision for Jesus Christ, but there has to be that meeting with Christ that you can't simply walk away from and shrug your shoulders as if nothing has happened. And as we preach, we are obligated by the grace of God to present material that can be used to confront people with that. And then all of these ecclesiastical dimensions of our lives and even of our ministries, at least in that time when we are together and are called upon to preach the word, they can be moved aside, and we can concentrate on the main issues. And one of the things that impresses me when I look at my own church, I've had the privilege of being, of being a member. It's not my church. I'm not the preacher in this church. But I've been the member of this church 
for pretty well 16, uh, 20 years of this same church. And I sit there in the congregation sometime when I'm not preaching there, and I, I sit back and I look over all these people. They're all dressed so nicely. You know, they come to church. They're well-dressed, and I see their families. But I know these people. I know them so well. And I look at them in the choir sometime in their robes. They all look so sanctified. And I look at them, but I know them. I know them. And I know that they are just like I am. They need Jesus desperately. Because I know some of the situations in their families. And I know some of the situations in their lives. And they may look just great. But I know some of the doubts that are rattling around in some of their souls. So when we are involved in preaching, that's what we're talking about in these messages here, the ethics of preaching, we have to concentrate on the basics. And our messages must contain the message of Jesus Christ. Now, the fourth context, which I'm only going to introduce tonight, and I'm going to spend tomorrow evening speaking about exclu it exclusively. And that is the context of ourselves, our own persons. The psychological baggage, the historic baggage that we carry with us as we make our ways through life. No one can get out of his own skin. No one can escape himself. We have our neuroticisms. We have all sorts of things that are wrong with us. But even so, when you go to the Bible, you discover that this person who you are, this person is the tool that you must use in your ministry. Fourth chapter of the book of First Timothy, you know it well, those of you who have thought about your own responsibility to preach, command and teach these things, Paul says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and life and love and faith and in purity until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of the scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. And then this, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And so the Apostle Paul says to this man, this young preacher, he says, listen, what you, what you have to take care of if you want to be useful to God in the ministry of the Word is this. You have to be concerned about your doctrine. He says that, doesn't he? He says, watch your doctrine carefully. That's why we have seminaries and colleges, divinity colleges. But he also says this. You have to watch yourself yourself. And that's, I think that's the, the really scary thing about the preaching of the gospel and being a minister of the gospel. I think this is why some of us resisted it so long before we finally did fall surrendering into this profession, this activity. We resisted it so long because we knew that once we got involved in the preaching of the gospel, we were going to be in bondage in a way that possibly other people would not be able to understand. But a preacher has skills, has talents, possibly, has an education that he receives, but when he preaches the gospel, he uses all those, but what he really uses is himself his own person. That's why it's so scary to preach, because there you stand, all of you, your whole person, and you're exposed to these people, and God is going to use you, all of you, in order to bring 
his message to them. And that's why there is, is such a necessity that those of us who feel ourselves called to preach and responsible to preach become aware of the ethics of preaching and the kinds of temptations that confront us and dedicate ourselves with continual fervor to the necessary self-disciplines that are the prerequisite if we're going to be used. And sometime I, I've been in conversation with some of you and some have said to me, well, what about motivations? Do we really have to be concerned about motivations? Because if we do, we set ourselves up for a situation that is impossible. After all, none of our motivations are perfectly pure, and I agree. I agree that that's true. But when I read the Bible, it seems to me that it's very clear that those who preach the gospel have the responsibility to monitor their interior life with great diligence because their usefulness is directly related to their own state of grace. So tomorrow evening I'd like to talk about this fourth context, this person, ourselves as preachers, and we'll get into that then. Thank you.